Terrific. Now, if you did miss Rick Mail yesterday, you won't know what the gunk tank is. Basically, on February the 5th, which is Comic Relief Night, somebody is going to be dropped into a large vat of gunk. And it's up to you to vote for the person you would most like to be see to be dropped in it, if you saw not know what I mean. This is the address to send your votes to. It's Gunk Tank, Children's BBC, Television Centre, London, W12 8QT. Gunk Tank, Children's BBC, Television Centre, London, W12 8QT. And speaking of Rick Mail... George's medicine was having some pretty exciting results. His revolting old grandma had gone right through the roof for a start. And down in the farmyard, George had given a beak full of the stuff to an unsuspecting brown hen. That hen was now growing into an unusually large bird. In fact, by the time it was finished, it was about as big as a horse. At that moment, George's mother came back from shopping in the village. She drove her car into the yard and she got out. She was carrying a bottle of milk in one hand and a bag of groceries in the other. The first thing she saw was the gigantic brown hen towering over little George. Well, she dropped the bottle of milk. <coughs> then Grandma started shouting at her from the rooftop. And when she looked up and saw Grandma's head sticking up through the tiles, she dropped the bag of groceries as well. How about that then, eh, Mary? Grandma shouted. I'll bet you've never seen a hen as big as that. That's George's giant hen, that is. But, 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 stammered George's mother. It's George's magic medicine, Grandma shouted. We both of us had it, the hen and I. But how in the world did you get up on the roof, cried the mother. Ah, ha, ha, I didn't, cackled the old woman. My feet are still standing on the floor in the living room. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Well, this was too much for George's mother to understand. She just goggled and gaped. She looked as though she was going to faint. A second later, George's father appeared. His name was Mr. Killy Cranky. He was a kind father to George, but he was not an easy person to live with, because even the smallest things got him all worked up and excited. And the hen standing in the yard was certainly not a small thing. And when Mr. Cranky saw it, he started jumping about as though something was burning his feet. Great heavens, he cried, waving his arms. What's this? What's happened? Where did it come from? It is a giant hen. Who did it? I did, George said. Look at me, Grandma shouted from the rooftop. Never mind about the hen. What about me? Mr. Cranky looked up and saw Grandma. Shut up, Grandma, he said. It didn't seem to surprise him that the old girl was sticking up through the roof. It was the hen that excited him. He'd never seen anything like it. But then who had? It's fantastic, Mr. Cranky shouted, dancing round and round. It's colossal. It's gigantic. It's tremendous. It's a miracle. How did you do it, George? And George started telling his father about the magic medicine. While he was doing this, the big brown hen sat down in the middle of the yard and went clack, 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 clackety, clack, 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 clack. And everyone stared at it. And when it stood up again, there was a brown egg lying there. The egg was the size of a football. That egg would make scrambled eggs for 20 people, Mrs. Cranky said. George, Mr. Cranky shouted, how much of this medicine have you got? Uh, lots, George said. There's a big saucepan full in the kitchen. And this bottle here is nearly full. Mr. Cranky grabbed George by the arm. Come with me, he yelled. Bring the medicine. Oh, for years and years I've been trying to breed bigger and bigger animals. Bigger bulls for, for beef, bigger pigs for pork, bigger sheep for mutton. And they went to the pigsty first. George gave a spoonful of medicine to the pig, and in a few moments, this is what it looked like. And the same thing happened when Mr. Cranky's herd of fine black bullocks each had a dose of George's medicine. After that, it was the sheep. Then George gave some to his grey pony, Jack Frost. And finally, just for fun, he gave some to Alma, the nanny goat. Grandma, from high up on the rooftop, could see everything that was going on. And she didn't like what she saw. She wanted to be the centre of attention, and nobody was taking the slightest notice of her. George and Mr Cranky were running round and getting excited about the enormous animals. Mrs Cranky was washing up in the kitchen, and Grandma was all alone on the rooftop. Hey! 
Hey, you! She yelled. George! Get me a cup of tea this minute, you idle little beast! Don't listen to the old goat, Mr. Cranky said. She's stuck where she is, and a good thing too. But we can't leave her up there, Dad, George said. What if it rains? George! Grandma yelled. Ugh, you horrible little boy! You disgusting little worm! Fetch me a cup of tea at once, and a slice of currant cake! We'll have to get her out, Dad, George said. She won't give us any peace if we don't. Mrs. Cranky came outside and agreed with George. She's my mother, she said. She's a pain in the neck, Mr. Cranky said. I don't care, Mrs. Cranky said. I'm not leaving my own mother sticking up through the roof for the rest of her life. So in the end, Mr. Cranky telephoned the crane company and asked them to send one of their biggest cranes out to the house at once. The crane arrived one hour later. It was on wheels and there were two men inside it. They put ropes under Grandma's arms and then she was lifted right up through the roof. In a way, the medicine had done Grandma good. It hadn't made her any less grumpy or bad-tempered, but it seemed to have cured all her aches and pains. And she was suddenly as frisky as a ferret. As soon as the crane had lowered her to the ground, she ran over to George's huge pony, Jack Frost, and jumped on his back. Then the ancient old hag galloped about the farm on the gigantic pony, jumping over trees and sheds and shouting, Get out of my way! Clear the decks! Stand aside, all you miserable midgets, or I'll trample you all to death! Yeah, and other silly things like that. But because Grandma was now much too tall to get back into the house, she had to sleep that night in the hay barn with the mice and the rats. <laughs> and the next day, George's father came down to breakfast in a state of even greater excitement than ever. I have been awake all night thinking about it, he cried. About what, Dad? George asked him. About your marvellous medicine, of course. We can't stop now, my boy. We must start making more of it at once. But why do we need more, Dad? George asked. We've done all our own animals, and we've made Grandma feel as frisky as a ferret, even though she does have to sleep in the barn. My dear boy, cried Mr Killy Cranky, we need barrels and barrels of it. Tons and tons. Then we will sell it to every farmer in the world so that all of them can have giant animals. We will build a marvellous medicine factory and sell the stuff in bottles at five pounds a time. We will become rich. You will become famous. But w wait a minute, Dad, said George. There's no waiting, cried Mr Cranky, working himself up so much that he put butter in his coffee and milk on his toast. Don't you understand what this tremendous invention of yours is going to do to the world? Nobody will ever go hungry again. Why won't they? asked George. Because one giant cow will give 50 buckets of milk a day. One giant chicken will make a hundred fried chicken dinners. And one giant pig will give you a thousand pork chops. It's tremendous! My dear boy, it's fantastic. It'll change the world. But wait a minute, Dad, George said again. Don't keep saying wait a minute, shouted Mr. Cranky. There isn't a minute to wait. We must get cracking at once. Do calm down, my dear, Mrs. Cranky said from the other end of the table, and stop putting marmalade on your cornflakes. Mr. Cranky leapt up from his chair. Never mind about the cornflakes, he cried. Come on, George, let's get going. When the new mixture is ready, we'll test it out on an old hen, just to make absolutely sure we've got it right. And after that, we'll shout hooray and build a giant factory. <laughs> but I can't possibly remember all the hundreds of things I put into the saucepan to make the medicine, said George. Of course you can, my dear boy, cried Mr. Cranky. I'll help you. I'll jog your memory. You'll get it in the end. You see if you don't. Now then, what was the very first thing you put in? Well... I went up to the bathroom first, George said. I used a lot of things in the bathroom and on Mummy's dressing table. Come on then, cried Mr. Cranky. Up we go, to the bathroom. And when they got there, they found a whole lot of empty tubes and empty aerosols and empty bottles. Oh, that's great, said Mr. Cranky. That tells us exactly what we need. If anything's empty, it means you used it. So Mr. Cranky started making a list of everything that was in the bathroom. And then they went on to Mrs. Cranky's dressing table. A box of powder, said Mr. Cranky, writing it down. Helga's hair set, flowers of turnips, perfume, 
Terrific! This is going to be easy! Where did you go next? Um, to the laundry room, George said. But are you sure you haven't missed out anything up here, Dad? Well, that's up to you, my boy, said Mr. Cranky. Have I? Uh, I don't think so, said George. Right. Down in the laundry room, Mr. Cranky wrote down the names of all the bottles and the cans. My goodness me! What a mass of stuff you need, he cried. No wonder you did magic things. Is that the lot? No, Dad, it's not, said George. And he led his father down to the shed. And there, on the table, were the five big empty bottles of animal medicines. Right, anything else? asked Mr. Cranky. And George scratched his head and thought and thought. But he couldn't remember having put anything else in. So, Mr. Killy Cranky leapt into his car and drove down to the village and bought new bottles and tubes and cans of everything on his list. And then he went to the vet and got a fresh supply of all the animal medicines George had used. Soon, all the things that Mr. Cranky had bought were lined up on the kitchen table. Now, show me how you did it, George, he said. Come along, show me exactly how you mixed them all together. One by one, George poured and squeezed the things into the saucepan. Keep at it, my boy, cried Mr. Cranky, dancing round the kitchen. Keep putting them in. Don't stop. Don't pause. Don't hesitate. It's a pleasure, my dear fellow, to watch you work. With everything so close at hand, the whole job didn't take George more than ten minutes. But when it was all done, the saucepan didn't somehow seem to be quite as full as it had been the first time. Now what did you do? cried Mr. Cranky. Did you stir it? I, I boiled it, George said, but not for long, and I stirred it as well. So Mr. Cranky lit the gas under the saucepan, and George stirred the mixture with the same long wooden spoon he'd used before. Ah, it's, it's not brown enough, George said. Wait a minute, I know what I've forgotten. What? cried Mr. Cranky. Tell me, quick, because if we've forgotten even one tiny thing, then it won't work. At least, not in the same way. A quart of brown gloss paint, George said. That's what I've forgotten. Mr. Killy Cranky shot out of the house and into his car like a rocket. He sped down to the village and he bought the paint and he rushed back again. He opened the can in the kitchen and <laughs> he handed it to George. George poured the paint into the saucepan. Aha! That's better, George said. That's much more like the right colour. It's boiling, cried Mr. Cranky. It's boiling and bubbling, George. Is it ready yet? It's ready, George said. At least I hope it is. Right, shouted Mr. Cranky, hopping about. Let's test it. Let's give some to a chicken. Thank you.